The Coming of Abel Behenna The little Cornish port of Pencastle was bright in the early April, when the sun had seemingly come to stay after a long and bitter winter. Boldly and blackly, the rock stood out against a background of shaded blue, where the sky, fading into mist, met the far horizon. The sea was of true Cornish hue, sapphire, save where it became deep emerald green in the fathomless depths under the cliffs, where the seal caves opened their grim jaws. On the slopes, the grass was parched and brown. The spikes of firs bushes were ashy grey, but the golden yellow of their flowers streamed along the hillside, dipping out in lines as the rock cropped up and lessening into patches and dots, till finally it died away altogether where the sea winds swept round the jutting cliffs and cut short the vegetation as though with an ever-working aerial shears. The whole hillside, with its body of brown and flashes of yellow, was just like a colossal yellow hammer. The little harbour opened from the sea between towering cliffs and behind a lonely rock pierced with many caves and blowholes through which the sea in storm time sent its thunderous voice together with a fountain of drifting spume. Hence it wound westwards in a serpentine course, guarded at its entrance by two little curving piers to left and right. These were roughly built of dark slates placed endways and held together with great beams bound with iron bands. Thence it flowed up the rocky bed of the stream whose winter torrents had of old cut out its way amongst the hills. This stream was deep at first, with here and there where it widened patches of broken rock exposed at low water, full of holes where crabs and lobsters were to be found at the ebb of the tide. From amongst the rocks rose sturdy posts used for warping in the little coasting vessels which frequented the port. Higher up, the stream still flowed deeply, for the tide ran far inland, but always calmly, for all the force of the wildest storm was broken below. Some quarter mile inland, the stream was deep at high water, but at low tide there were at each side patches of the same broken rock as lower down, through the chinks of which the sweet water of the natural stream trickled and murmured after the tide had ebbed away. Here, too, rose mooring posts for the fishermen's boats. At either side of the river was a row of cottages, down almost on the level of high tide. They were pretty cottages, strongly and snugly built, with trim narrow gardens in front, full of old-fashioned plants, flowering currants, coloured primroses, wallflower and stone crop. Over the fronts of many of them climbed clematis and wisteria. The window sides and door posts of all were as white as snow, and the little pathway to each was paved with light-coloured stones. At some of the doors were tiny porches, whilst at others were rustic seats cut from tree trunks or from old barrels. In nearly every case the window ledges were filled with boxes or pots of flowers or foliage plants. Two men lived in cottages exactly opposite each other across the stream. Two men, both young, both good-looking, both prosperous, and who had been companions and rivals from their boyhood. Abel Behenna was dark, with the gypsy darkness which the Phoenician mining wanderers left in their track. Eric Sanson, which the local antiquarium said was a corruption of Saga Manson, was fair, with the ruddy hue which marked the path of the wild Norsemen. These two seemed to have singled out each other from the very beginning to work and strive together, to fight for each other, and to stand back to back in all endeavours. 